Okay. So, so why, one reason Apple wanted to have a stock split is that sometimes when stocks have too big of a stock price, it's difficult for uh, investors to buy shares if it's too, too expensive. You know, you have a $500 stock, the average or small investor is not going to really have the ability to purchase that on a regular basis. Or they may extreme value the stock. They may look at the stock like a piece of clothing and say, oh, it's overvalued, it's $500. Not knowing that valuation has to match with the amount of outstanding shares. So psychologically, a, a stock split is more for psychological effect on the investor and to create more demand for the stock. If your stock is going to exist in the 35 to $75 area, investors are more comfortable buying larger quantities of stock at this range. You know, there's, psychologically, they may want to always have 100 shares. It's not easy to get 100 shares of, say, Google at $800. But, you know, if the stock is trading at $35, it's very easy for a small investor to get the 100 shares. You know, so the stock split is part, partly psychological. You know, um, to get the price in the manageable range. And there are stocks like Cisco and Microsoft in the 90s that routinely went up a great deal and then had a stock split. You know, five or six of these in a 10-year period. And you can, you can imagine how well you have, you're an investor, how quickly your shares start piling up. So at the end of your run, you start with 100 and then you come away with 1,200 shares and the stock price goes back up to the original purchase price. You see how much money you've really made. So that's why generally companies, only companies in a good financial position also can split their stock. There has to be growing demand for the company as well. It helps to create a little additional liquidity. All right. Treasury stock is another type of stock that when a company, a lot of companies today are making record profits as they keep salaries down and, and lay people off or don't hire new people and cut benefits. A lot of money has been piling up at these corporations. So the money that's been piling up, they've been using to buy back stock. Now, in Finance 330, you should have done the Zoom simulation. I think that's in most sections of 330. And if you were good at that game, you know that buying back your stock helped to push up your earnings per share and your stock price. So you may have had the same performance as everybody else, but if you were the one team that was smart enough to buy back your stock in round two or three, you'll see that you have a smaller amount of outstanding shares because you're buying back the stock at a lower price. So you're reducing the amount of outstanding shares, which is boosting all your per share variables. All your per share ratios are now boosted. So a company, and IBM has done this for many quarters for a long time, that they may have had flat revenues and profits, but they showed investors um, higher earnings per share by aggressively buying back stock. And if you're a current investor uh, and you know, for a while when dividends were heavily ta taxed, you would prefer them to buy back the stock for the stock price to go up rather than pay you a dividend you have to pay tax on. So when they buy all the stock back, it comes off of the public market and goes into the treasury uh, position of the balance sheet. So now the company has a new asset in their equity area called treasury stock, which is the company owning its own stock. And in future years, they can take this treasury stock and buy another company with it and say, listen, we want to buy your company. We'll give you two shares of our company's stock for every one share of your, your company. And you can actually buy another company with the treasury stock. Um, you could use it, um, you know, at a later date, say, is a common strategy that you feel your stock is underappreciated, undervalued. So you go ahead and buy back the stock while it's cheap. At a certain date, the stock becomes a little overvalued, so you start selling your treasury stock because it could be a source of additional profits for a company if they want to market time the system a little bit. And they can also use the stock and the treasury stock to give to employees. Yeah. Yes. They just follow the rules of the SEC. They say, they tell them at this point, we're going to buy back X amount of shares. That's all. So you just tell the SEC on this date, we plan, you know, or this period of time, we plan to buy back a million shares. SEC makes that knowledge public and then there's no 
you know, a company, I don't know of any company that's ever been charged with, you know, insider trading on their own stock because they have to announce when they're planning to repurchase the stock and investors get to know that ahead of time. In fact, in Yahoo Finance, there's an area where uh, it shows you who, what insiders and, and, you know, gives you a detail of what's happening with the stock, who are the big buyers of it and what the company's doing. So you can get, before they actually do it, even exact, anybody who's working at a high level in the company before they buy or sell the stock, like say Bill Gates and Microsoft, he has to announce to the SEC and announce to the public, I plan on selling X amount of shares or buying X amount of shares. So there are people who go and analyze this and say, okay, all the top executives say they're planning to buy shares of the stock, probably a good time to buy the stock. Or all executives are now planning to sell the stock or have told the SEC they're going to sell the stock at a certain date. Probably a good time to sell the stock. So a lot of people research the stocks based on who, who in the company is buying and selling and why. You know, when Bill Gates would sell Microsoft stock, he would make it clear, like, listen, I'm not selling Microsoft stock because I don't believe in the company. I'm selling it because I need to diversify my assets. And this, you know, so he would give a motivation for why he's selling it. And then investors could say, okay, he's not bailing out of the company. He's just trying to move some money out of Microsoft into his charitable trust or into, you know, other assets. So, so there's a lot of research and investigation that can go into this area to see, okay, why are, companies, why are companies buying back their stock or why are the company's top em employees and executives buying or selling their stock? And this hopefully will give you a better idea. If if company believes in itself enough to buy back its stock, then that's probably a better company to buy than you know, a company that's not going to buy back their stock. Or you could, be just so, you could just be a company that has so much extra money that they don't know what to do with it. So they have one easy thing to do is to buy back the stock and, and keep investors from crying about it. Investors don't like it when you pile up billions and billions of dollars in the bank to earn 1% interest. So they say, listen, buy back the stock, drive up the stock price, and then the investors can make more money or buy another business. Now, stock can also be classified into different types of trading shares. You know, for example, this, there's um, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, any type of class you want. And primarily what they do is they want to differentiate the voting rights. So say, used to be, in a commonality, you need 51% of the voting ownership of the stock and voting to control a company. Now, what if you want to, you don't want to have to hold on to 51% of the company. You want to unlock more money for yourself and you want to sell 75% of the company. Well, one way you can do that, and, um, and actually here's an example of Ford that did that. They create a separate class of shares for the controlling interest of the family or certain key executives or owners uh, where they have majority of the voting rights. So they could sell another class of stock that has re diminished voting rights but both classes of stock are still going to, you know, go up and down at the same, at the same level. It's just that you're buying a class of stock without, you know, definitive voting rights. So if you're someone who just wants the money the company makes and you don't plan on voting anyway, then you would, buy, you would be offered the other class. So there'd be a way for a small group of people to control a large company by owning a, major, a, a, a minority of actual stock in the company. So they may only have a 10% ownership, but they own Class B stock, so they have 90% of the voting rights. So it's just a way of manipulating the stock so that people who want to stay in control of the company can stay in control while actually allowing a majority of the company to be sold to the public. Uh, they could really do other things with these different types of, of um, besides voting rights, they could do different dividends, uh, different payouts, um, different perks if they wanted to. S yes. Yeah, when they, if they're doing different classes, they could, you know, they can go public with one class um, and do a private sell of the other class. So it's, they're both publicly traded, but one is going to be a little bit more exclusive who they sell it to. Yes. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. You know. But they'll trade as two different stocks. They won't trade as the same as stock. But they could they could issue them at the same time at the same price. And then they could they could deviate later on. You know. 
And then sometimes the stock, generally the stock with the voting rights, you would think would go up faster, be more valuable. But typically it isn't because it's usually less liquid. Since you only pick a few people, give access to it to a few people, liquid, there's not a lot of liquidity there. So generally a lot of people will stay with the class A. It's a lot more liquid to move in and out of. Uh, so companies have a certain amount of control of what type of class stock they want to sell and what type of privileges those classes of stock have. But it could, it could backfire on them. They, they could create a new class of stock and the people who own, say, class A, and now they create a class B and C, they could look at them creating these new classes of stock and they're being diluted and they could say, you know, B and C are getting all these dividends and special benefits and voting rights. I hate this company. I'm going to sell my shares of A and maybe, maybe try and buy B or C or just move on to another company. So if they do it in a way that, that pisses off the common stockholders in Class A, they may actually bring the stock price down. And still, majority of people who own Class B probably also own some of Class A. People who own Class A probably don't own much of Class B. You know, so they, they have a vested interest in making sure that the stock they have at the Class A level for everybody is a fair deal. If they're going to do something that's not fair with the other classes and restrict the access to it, investors are going to vote the stock down. And then that's going to be, you know, not good uh, for the company at all. So they're usually pretty careful. And, and generally, they're more interested in the voting rights of the company than the actual um, stock appreciation price. This is just an example of um, a stock quote from Yahoo. And um, this is a clothing store. And at the time it was trading at 35. Today, anyone who get a, a current quote on that? Someone who has? No. Okay, so it hasn't changed too much. Retail, apparel retail hasn't appreciated as much le lately because people are staying away from the malls and they're buying their apparel online or I guess in other other ways so the malls the the, the retail outlets the mall ones that were previously very successful they're having trouble increasing their revenues increasing their sales because I guess apparently people are getting their clothes in other ways or you know, it could be that, you know, if you shop for clothes at the mall, you're generally paying a premium price for those. If you could get them for less online, you know, that could be affecting their sales. But generally, this year has been a horrible year for especially mall-based retailers. Many of them have struggled and had challenges trying to move their merchandise. Not the companies that make the clothes. They've been doing good because they've been selling more clothes, but they're just not selling everything through um, the malls. And one, one aspect of that too is um, these new, what do you call them, outlet centers that they have. They're not considered a mall, they're considered an outlet and some people are shifting their purchases to these outlet centers uh, and factory outlet stores rather than the shopping at the mall. Um, okay, we've talked about this before, round lots and odd lots. Uh, tr round lots are the trading in multiples of 100 shares and odd lots are generally numbers that aren't multiples of 100, usually less than 100. Um, trading in, in odd lots is generally considered uh, the hallmark of an unsophisticated, small, unknowledgeable investor. And in a exuberant stock market where you have a bull market and everybody wants to get on, get on and everybody thinks they could be a good stock trader, you get a lot of these small investors coming in at the end of these bull markets and buying a lot of stock in these odd lot trades. So there are people who do research that look at the amount of odd lot trading and there's always a point where it gets to a high which sort of denotes the top of the bull market. And they know to sell their stock and get out. And then, of course, the market crashes soon after they do that, and all these small investors get burned, and they just never invest in stocks again. They learn their lesson. But they're doing what small investors do, buy high and sell low. And we see this constantly, not just with stocks, but also mutual funds. Let's talk about some value. Everybody likes a good value, right? The value pack, 
value deal, the value meal. Um, when, we, when we talk about par value, that's an accounting stipulation. That is not, has anything really to do with the real value or the face value of the stock. Um, or I should say the tradable value of the stock. The par value is just this accounting term that when we do our bookkeeping and we issue the stock, we issue what we call it a par value for, account it, for accounting. And it could be $1, $5, it's usually a minimal amount. And it's, it's totally divorced from uh, the actual value of the stock. The actual value of the stock is not based on the par value in any way. It's just sort of this leftover, uh, it's like an appendix in accounting uh, it's not really needed, not useful at all to investors. The book value is very useful to investors. That's telling you uh, what the actual value of the stock is. So the book value, there's, um, there's a store. Let me get to Yahoo Finance. There's a store called the Container Store. Has anybody seen this store? Does anybody know where one is? Garden City? Okay. I, I haven't seen any of them around here. I saw them in other states. Internet slow. Google searching for information on me. All right. We have to wait for Google to get all their information advertisements in line before they'll let me go to this site, I guess. But I wanted, if you go to the container store, I was looking at them yesterday because they had a bad day yesterday. They went down 20, 25% of their value eroded. And I think it's simply the container store is the symbol. Okay. So we see here that um, early, early in the year, this stock was about $47, and now it's 15 And if we look at the key statistics, so between yesterday and today, I think it went down like $6. Okay, so we come down on the key statistics, and down here we see the book value per share is $4. It's actually not, it's not, that's not too bad. Uh, there are some companies that, I was looking at a, diff a different company, I forgot what that was, where the, the book value, uh, oh, I know, could that be the, um, the book value of the company was higher than the stock price. Uh, what company was that now? can't remember. It's an interesting case because th theoretically you could buy, the book value is about $5. The stock was trading at about um, $3. So theoretically you could buy all the stock in the company and sell the assets of the company, pay down the debts, and, be, and still have a profit of $3 per share. Because the company's worth $6 per share the book value, which means book value is take all the assets, sell all those, pay all your liabilities off, and this is what you're left with in the difference. So if your assets are greater than your liabilities, that equity is your book value. So if the book value is $6 per share and the stock's only trading at $3 per share, you theoretically can buy all the stock, say you could buy all the stock for $3 a share, which you really can't, but if you did, you can then turn around and sell the assets of the company for $6. Maybe the company has $6 per share sitting in a bank account as cash. There you would just have to, you know, think of that. You, you could buy a company, think of it in smaller terms. You could, for $25,000, you could buy a company that has $50,000 of cash in the bank and no debt. Wouldn't you, wouldn't you buy that company? Yeah, because you buy the company, take the cash, and then close it down. Or... You know, maybe after you take the cash, sell it to somebody else for 10000 and make even more money on whatever's left of the company. So sometimes this generally doesn't happen in buying and selling companies in the real world for cash. That would very rarely happen. But in the stock market, weird things happen where the prices fall so quickly that the book value of the company starts to get um, 
above the stock price. There was a point where Apple's book value was $13 a share, and the company was trading at tw uh, $12, $11 a share. So you're basically getting the company for free after the assets. Um, so the container store uh, had some trouble. And basically, what was the problem with the container store? Does anybody know? look at the uh, let's just look at a five-day chart nope their stores that they have open they have not been able to increase the sales per store or their profits and if you remember again from finance 330 if you played the zoom simulation game and you were one of those teams uh, keep asking the professor I don't know why we're not doing well. We can't get a stock price. We're in last place. What's our problem? I'm doing everything right. And I said, you know, you just, you don't know squat about business because you're not increasing your profit margin. You're letting it fall and you're not increasing your revenue. So what investor would want your company? Oh, so you mean business is about making profits and increasing revenues? Yeah. Why didn't you learn that in introduction to business class? Oh, I thought business was about making a great product that had a lot of quality in it and selling it at a loss. Why would you think that? Well, I think why you might think that is because all the companies try to try to sell you that bi that bill of sales, that our products have the highest quality and we're selling it at a loss or we're selling it so cheaply and they, that's what they're trying to make you believe. You're believing in so much you think that's how a company should run. But like they're supposed to teach you in the introduction to business class and the finance class, you need to increase revenues. You need to increase profits if you're going to keep investors excited in buying your stock. And when you don't do it, this happens. In one day, they came out and said, and, and their sales were just a little bit smaller and their profits were just a little bit lower. And investors say, you know what? I'm out of here. I could do that because it's not on tape. <laughs> But that's basically what the investors said. Screw you, I'm out of here. If you're not going to be a winning company that's increasing sales and revenues, that's the company I want to own and be with. And when you can't deliver that, I'm done. See, here we go. Fall 25% on weak sales. First headline right here. Um, but if you read into it, read into it a little more, it's um, sales and profits. And then, then invest, analysts dump all over them and downgrade them. And it's just a whole world of negativity hate. It's like the hate zone. Yes. So See, that's a good question because for a stock like this, you got to wait for this hate storm to be over. So this hate storm will swirl around this stock. People who owned it that got burned and people who are just disgusted with an analyst dumping all over it. And sometimes and this happened to a lot of companies, Microsoft, Apple, many companies go through this phase, but eventually if it's the type of company that can get their act together and correct it and the management's good, uh, there's going to be a point where, you know, this stock may go to under $10. But if you believe the management and I believe in the store, it's going to be something. I kind of look at the container store like IKEA without the furniture. If you've ever been to one, it's sort of like IKEA without the furniture. You know when you get done with the upper levels of IKEA and you go down to the bottom level and it's all like the knickknacks and stuff? That's kind of like what this store is. Um, anytime, anytime I miss Queens, I just go to the IKEA because it seems like everybody in Queens is there shopping. I don't know why, but, right? Okay, so this is something that would have been, you know, yesterday when I was looking at this, and like, I should short the stock because I'm sure it's going to keep going down because of all the negativity. There's no reason to buy it right now because they're probably going to have a couple quarters where they're trying to fix this problem. And what they really need to do is probably a fundamental business thing. They need to go in. It's not the economy, really. It's really what is the mix of products they're selling and why aren't people excited about their store anymore? And one of the key things they look at is they can open more stores to increase revenues, but investors aren't, aren't stupid. They want to look at the same store sales. So, okay, you may increase your revenues by opening more stores. That's fine. But if you're not also increasing revenues at the same stores from last year, then we know you're just trying to expand your way out of um, to increase your revenues, and that's never a good situation. 
So a lot of when you analysts will always look to see, you know, we see the top line revenue growth, but what is the actual growth per same store sales? So what did the, the stores you had last year, what are their sales this year and how much are they growing? So if, you're say, if your original stores or your stores have been open for a while are continuing to grow and you're opening new locations, that's going to really propel the stock higher because it's showing that you're growing your core business and expanding it. You're not trying to, uh, and this is a big thing for fast food restaurants too. They look at, is this fast food sales at this fast food restaurant, is it increasing in, in the existing restaurants besides the amount of growth they have by opening new restaurants? And the way they can do that at existing restaurants, say you're the Chipotle Mexican Grill, right? What, new, what was one new item or, that they added to Chipotle to increase sales? What? No, they've always had that. What? No, that's secret menu. No, they always had that, depending on where, what state they're in. Think you don't like meat. Yes, they, they had a new, a new filling option because they have their steak and they have their beef and their pork. And so vegetarians like, well, I want to like Chipotle, but there's nothing for me to like there. So they said, oh, we'll, we'll put some tofu and throw some flavorings on it. And then you can have a burrito or a rice bowl or a taco. But what you were mentioning, they do have the secret menu at uh, Chipotle. And that's one of the items that you can get. If you're in the know, although the top, the, the grills around here are dumb, the employees, and you're like, oh, I want this from the secret menu. They're like, what? I just started yesterday. <laughs> Don't bother me with this shit now. And seriously, that's, uh, I just, if you go somewhere like Colorado, they're all hip to it and you just order it and out here, they're just dumb as, they don't really express that. And it's because there's a lot of turnover at these fast food restaurants out here. You know, you don't see, maybe the manager stays, but the, the overall employees, they just, I guess they get tired of it after a while. I mean, I don't blame them. It's a hard job, right? Got to respect them, though, because you want your lunch, right? And they're cooking it for you. So and they have, like, the thing there, they're all, like, lined up together at that, you know, they're all, like, shoulder to shoulder to move the line really fast. That's got to be annoying after a while. Like, people get away from me. What? I think they pay a little bit better than the average. Yeah, I think they're kind of a step, their, their whole identity is we're a step above fast food. We're fast casual. So we pay our employees more. We have organic and better sourced non-antibiotic, non-growth hormone ingredients. So they're trying to be sort of like um, a level higher than the average. And that's sort of the key to their success because people are like, I feel dirty and disgusted with myself if I, and I can't even tell anybody if I go to Burger King or McDonald's because they look at me like I'm a loser. But I can go to this, you know, cash, fast casual like Panera or Chipotle and I can order food there and I could brag about it and people don't, they, they look up to me, <laughs> you know. And that's been a success, one of the secrets of their success is that you know, people feel proud to go there. They're happy about it. They feel like they're getting something that's healthy for them and that isn't completely breaking the bank. You know, it's like, I've been a smart choice. I didn't throw out $60 for two people to eat at Outback. We went to Panera Bread and we had a healthier meal and we, you know, didn't have, we paid half of that. Yes, they, I've noticed that too. It seems like they're putting less than ever. And that might be a way of cutting costs because the meat is the, the most expensive ingredient. So if they can give you more red, more rice, and more beans, and just that little tiny thimble of meat. And I look at the guy like, seriously? That wasn't even a full scoop. Like, oh, if you want more, I have to charge you extra. I'm like, no, I don't want more. I want the appropriate amount. I gave you the appropriate amount. Like, no, that was not, that was a very level sir, spoonful. That was not the appropriate amount. Well, what do you want from me? I, I want a decent burrito is what I want. I'm paying like $8 for this shit. Come on. That wasn't me talking. That was a customer I overheard talking uh, at the Mexican Grill. I just take whatever they give me and shut up and just move along. I don't want to cause a problem. Uh, okay, so that's book value. Now, market value is just the current price of the stock. 
whatever the current price of the stock is. So there's a diff, there's always there's generally always a difference between book and market. The book value should, oh, generally is lower than the market value, and the market value changes continuously. The book value will change as they release new uh, financial statements. Now, market capitalization is a very um, interesting thing to look at. So if we go back to uh, Google, the container store's market capitalization is about $758 million. And I'm always curious as to how that relates to sales. What type of sales do they have? And they probably have over a billion dollars in sales. And they have actually, oh, no, the revenues are almost identical to their market cap. Generally, most retail stores, if they're decent, will be two times, their market cap will be two times the revenue. If they're really good, it could be three times the revenue. If they're kind of bad, I guess it's one times the revenue. As far as, and that's how you could kind of look at a retailer. If, a re, if you think a retailer is going to become successful, you can almost say they should be, the stock should be trading at two or three times their revenue. And it gives you another way of forecasting what the stock price should be. So what is like, um, if we think of a hot retailer, uh, what's a retailer that's doing well? Any ideas? I have no ideas. Maybe Macy's? Oh, that's a good one. Let's do Target. Uh, there we go. Target. Okay, so their market cap is, say, $40 billion, And the market cap is the outstanding stock times the share price. It's basically what the stock market is saying the company is worth. So if you take the price of the stock, multiply it by all the outstanding shares, this is the actual price of the company, or the value the stock market says. And the stock market says Target is worth $39.23 billion. That's a lot of money. Let's see what their revenues are. Okay, their revenues are $43 billion. So almost twice, almost double. And that's what you would expect for, you know, a decent retailer. $39 billion, and they're about $72, $73 billion in revenue. So not far from double their revenue. Um, i trying to think of a really a retailer that's kind of hot as far as sales are increasing and it's like an... Um, Costco? No, Costco, they've never been hot. They've been always good in quality, but something that's like taking off lately and you see a lot, a lot of new locations open up. It's hard to think of one though in the retail space. Uh, I know uh, something like Staples has sort of been disappointing. What? Well, let's, let's look at that. I don't know if they have a stock. They have a stock, if they're publicly traded, I don't know. They might not, they may have a, a bigger brand above them or. Um. So like I have a question, um, like I'm, I noticed like everyone on Patrick has been on the like dry, like super dry, like and like I don't know what the word is for that. But like what is super dry? Okay, well, let's look that up because that could be all right. So this is we do. Uh, Staples is seven billion, seven point four three billion market cap. It's not considered a really exciting retailer right now, and their sales are twenty two billion. So actually, they're they're about double. They had eleven. Well, they they were eleven billion in market cap, right? I think. I forget now. On, oh no, the market cap seven billion. So actually, they're triple. So they are sort of a hotter retailer right now. Their their uh, market cap is their sales are triple. I'm getting this all wrong. Their revenues are 22 billion, but their market cap is only seven billion. Okay, so they're out of favor because if they were um, a decent retailer, they'd at least be their market cap would be equal to the revenues. And if they were an exciting retailer, they could be double. But their market is actually great. Their market cap is actually very 
well below their revenues. So this is an example, like I had thought previously, an out of fashion um, retailer that of having problems in increasing revenues. What was the name of that other? Superman. Super? Like Superman? Yeah, or it could be, is it a brand of another company? Okay, so that's something to watch. If they have, I mean, Under Armour was like that too. They were in public company right away, but that's something to keep on your radar. Because if that is something that's trending and people are going to all be, is it something that competes with Under Armour? Like something you wear and keeps keeps you from being sweaty? No, it's like I literally like the same thing about like Nike. Okay. Do they have their own store, or is it just like a brand that sell is sold in stores? So they have their own store. Okay, so they're probably too small yet to have a public offering, but that could be something that when they have a public offering, what ideally what you would want is a company to already be public, but have yet to take off, and it's just starting to take off, and you're starting to notice it and can get in because if a company takes off and then they have the IPO, all that taking off enthusiasm is very priced into the IPO. What you want is a company that has a slower trajectory that has got to a point of success where they can have an IPO, but it wasn't a blowout. But then a couple of years later, everybody starts really deciding that they need to wear this, this clothing. And then, then that will be a breakout stock. Who? Not, not when oil prices are going down. You know, uh, if you got into a solar company before the big oil peak, that would have been uh, a breakout scenario. Um, speaking of breakouts, let's look at Market Watch, see how the class is doing. Fall. All right. It's going to take a second to load. Um, the market had a really down day yesterday. And that was because of in perception of increased risk in the global economy. Oh. Bummer. doesn't have me auto logged in so we'll come back to this when we're not recording all right investment value it's what people think the company's worth so you could have um, investment value sort of where you think the stock should be trading at so if you think a company like staples at eleven dollars a share should really be more like twenty two dollars a share or $30 a share, so its market cap will be closer in line to its actual revenues, then that would be what you feel is an investment value. And if your investment value is higher than the, co the stock is currently trading at, that's a stock to buy. But it's something that you have to use a lot of different tools and resources and approaches to come up with investment value. And I mentioned a couple of things today in class about looking at who's buying the stock, insiders buying the stock, the company buying back its own stock, looking at its revenues and sales projections and tra uh, trajectories, uh, just analyzing the overall value of its products. And this is something that people need anymore. You know, I mean, if you, if you, Early on, you could have looked at Blockbuster and said, you know what, in the future, people aren't going to really like this solution. It's time to short the stock. If you were that progressive in your thinking and could get there that early. You know, a lot of people can't think that progressively, think ahead, think that strategically about certain companies, where they're going to be. If you look at certain retailers and say, you know what, people are just aren't going to shop in JCPenney's anymore. It's just not so short the stock. Well, you're a couple years too late because everybody knows that. So you you got to see the trends and connect the dots ahead of time. And if you could be right six out of ten times you, that you do this, you can make a lot of money. Just have to be right six out of ten times. And if you follow what I was saying in the other class, when you're wrong, if you can acknowledge it quickly and get rid of that stock and then try out another stock, you could 
hold on to the stocks that you're right about for a longer period of time and get rid of the four stocks you're wrong about, then you'll make a fabulous return in the stock market. So it's all about expect to be wrong, but correct your mistakes quickly um, and keep your successes longer. And it, a lot of times described as don't pick the don't pick the flowers over the weeds. So if you have a stock that is great and you believe in it and is doing very well, there's no reason to sell it. Even if there's, there's some, even the stock goes down temporarily, if the long-term strategy is still a good one, you hold on to it. But there might be a stock that you bought because you thought that this would be a good company and then over the months and weeks that pass, it's just more negative news or negative news and you're just like, ugh, forget it. And uh, one company had problems yesterday too with SodaStream. This is the company that makes the, you make your own soda add your flavor and it sort of investors are sort of deciding that you know what that's more of a fad than than a real long-term company and the stock's going down and w why do you think that this could be a fad and one reason i feel everybody that i know that has one of these devices the way I kind of judge it is when I look at something new, I look to see how long it stays on the kitchen counter. So remember those George Foreman grills? When those started moving off the kitchen counter into the closet, I knew that was over. When these soda streams were new and people wanted to play with it and make their own soda, eventually they need the counter space and they're opting to put it away, sort of like your juice maker or different things. You know that that's not like a toaster or a toaster oven or a blender. It's not going to be something that people are going to use constantly enough that they're going to be replacing it. It's something that you get as a gift. You buy once and then you just don't look at continuing to buy the, the soda uh, flavorings for it. The exception to this is the Keurig. I've pretty much never seen anybody take the Keurig off their kitchen counter. If anything, they got a bigger one or a carousel to run the pods with. You know, so those, when I see those in people's homes and then I see them actually in offices in office kitchens, I know that this product's here to stay. I've never seen a soda stream in someone's office kitchen. You know, and I've, I've, so this is like some of the common sense you use to try to value stocks. So here we got a, uh, you know, it's a $22 stock. It was $60 earlier in the year, $64. And I think the year before it was even getting close to 100. The market cap is 425 million and the revenues are 574 million. So that's always a danger sign. If the market cap is lower than the revenues, it's a stock out of favor. So you can actually look at the momentum. If a stock revenues start getting closer to the market cap or past the market cap, that's a buy signal. But when the revenues start getting, if the revenues are above the market cap and the market cap's moving up and the revenues are moving down, that's a definite sell strategy. So what you really ideally want is a stock whose revenues are moving up faster than, um, no, not necessarily. You want the revenues to be moving up, but you want the stock capitalization to be moving up faster than the revenues because that means that people are increasing the valuation of the stock and they're buying more of it and driving the price higher. Hopefully you can have both expanding revenues and, and e uh, even faster trajectory in the market cap and that would be ideal for a, um, an investment strategy. Okay. Uh, dividends. So let's talk about dividends. Source of income to investors. So we have the plain cash dividend where you just get cash, card, whole, hard, cold cash. And they, the companies decide when they want to give that return to you. And if companies, the idea is companies do well, and they make lots of money, they should return some of that to you as an investor as a dividend to sort of repay you for owning the stock. Um, and usually a lot of companies like to keep their dividends a little bit more dependable, predictable. So it's a, uh, most companies' dividends are more predictable than capital gains. So even though the stock price may go down, capital gains may diminish, they still will pay a dividend as long as the company's still profitable. Dividends, as we learned in a previous chapter, uh, the max taxation rate on dividend is 15%. Uh, so that's a lower tax rate than most people pay. Most people who own stock and are earning dividends are on a much higher tax bracket. So a 15% tax on dividends makes them more attractive. And one reason companies are offering more dividends. Okay. 
All right. And this, this, in 2013, depending on your level of income, they made an adjustment to the law. So the higher earners now will pay 20%, not 15%. So if you're a lower earner, just like the capital gains, they sort of paired the dividends in the capital gains model. But still 20%, if you're a higher end earner, your tax rate may be 30% or 28%, you're still paying less taxes than if you earn the money at a company. And companies do like to increase their dividends. They don't like to cut them. If a company cuts their dividend, that's a warning sign that the company is doing bad and the stock price usually goes down. So a lot of times if the, if the company wants to increase their stock price, they'll announce that we're doing so well, we decided to increase the dividends. And that's going to put more value on the stock and it's going to show investors that the company is more stable. They feel so good about their future prospects, they're raising the dividends. So not only does it make the company more valuable because the dividend's going up, it makes the perception of the company more valuable and makes the stock go up. So raising dividends is something companies always strive for, but they have to be careful if they overstrip raising the dividends to a point where they really can't sustain it, then there's going to be an awful backlash when they have to actually take the dividend down. And this is why issuing more shares of stock um, sometimes makes it harder for them to maintain that dividend. All right. There are certain key dates for dividends. We have the date, declaration date, the date they declare the dividend, say we're going to pay a dividend. And then they have these two mysterious dates, date of record and ex-dividend date. So what these mean that is that you have to own the stock on the ex-dividend date. If you, sell the if you own the stock on the 16th all the way to the end of the day and you sell the stock on the 17th, you're still going to get the dividend. Because the date of record uh, has to go back two days. And this would be uh, a reflection of, of before there was computers. When they established the data record, they needed time to go and make sure everybody who owned it. So it, it basically, they, ha they would have to go back two days to, to do that paper-wise and have enough time. So it's sort of a, a fallout from the older times. But uh, if you buy, say, the dividend payments on the 30th, a lot of people try to buy the stock on the 28th or the 29th. They don't going to get the dividend. Owning the stock before the dividend payment doesn't guarantee you getting the dividend. You have to own the stock um, up to or and on the date of the, date of the ex dividend date. So if you're if you're recorded as owning the stock on that day, you're going to get the dividend. Even if you just bought it on the 15th or 16th and held the stock, you're recorded as owning it on that day. Then you're going to get the dividend. The next day you can sell it. And generally the stocks though, they're not dumb. The stocks actually um, will lose that dividend value the next day because they know that people, um, once the dividend is taken away from being able to earn it when you purchase it, the stock price goes down in a similar amount of money reflecting the fact that it's no longer eligible to collect the dividend. So people who try to buy and sell to get these dividends, generally the stock price already has that money built in and takes it out, depending on what day it is. A lot of times there, there are test questions like this saying that, you know, giving you some dates or a little calendar and saying, you know, if you own a stock on this date, will you be collecting the dividend? That's why another reason it's important to know these dates. But what's most important, I think, is that if you are a shareholder, and, and you're expecting, you're buying a stock to get a, a dividend. Because at one point, Microsoft paid out like a dollar dividend per share. So if you try to buy it the day before, you were going to get that dividend. You know. Earnings per share, this is something that you should learn in your accounting class or finance class. And it's basically the earnings of the company, the net profits, take away any preferred stock obligations. Uh, which we call preferred dividends, divide it by the outstanding shares and you get your earnings per share, which is important to you because if you own one share of stock, you want to know what's the relationship between my stock price and my earnings. If the $5 earnings per share and the stock is trading at $25, you know, that's a PE multiple of five or the, the price of the stock is trading at five times the earnings. So it's an important relationship between earnings and stock price. Uh, the dividend yield is something where we just take uh, the actual annual dividends and divide by the current stock price. So if the stock is, the dividend's $1 and the stock is $10, it's a 10% yield. 
That's all. It's just a simple yield. Just like if you had a bank account and you had ten dollars in the bank account and they gave you a dollar in dividends, you have a ten percent yield. Can you imagine how wonderful that would be if you had a thousand dollars in the bank and they gave you a ten percent dividend? You got a hundred dollar dividend from the bank a year on your thousand dollars. Doesn't happen. But it can happen in certain stocks or bonds. Although it's very rare to have a stock with a ten percent dividend. Usually they're between the one to five percent range. But if we want to know what the dividend is, and since the stock price changes every day, the dividend yield changes every day. So you may have a stock that has a devastating day in its stock price, but pays, but may not really have anything to do with their future uh, ability to generate revenues and income. And it gets to a point where the dividend yield is so high, you may want to buy the stock just for its yield. Um, the dividend payout looks at how much dividends are paying out of the earnings. So if your earnings are $5 again per share, and they're going to pay a $1 dividend, that's a 20% payout. If they're going to pay $5 out as a dividend and they earn $5 per share, it's a 100% payout. So we're looking at, this is important because you don't want the dividend per share to be too high of a percentage of the earnings per share because it's going to make it more difficult for them to maintain it or increase it. So if the dividend, say, represents 5% of their earnings per share, it's easy for them to increase the dividend because they have so much earnings to support it. So that's one time we're kind of curious is, and some companies may even peg the ratio and say, whatever we earn as a company, we're going to pay out at 10% of those earnings to you as a dividend. And so that's another important aspect. So if you know, if you want to know what your dividend is, you look at what the earnings are that quarter. So companies can make policies like that. Now, those are cash dividends. We also have something called a stock dividend which is not cash. It's basically giving you more shares of a stock. It's sort of like a mini stock split. So you might have a stock that's $100 per share, and they want to give you a stock dividend, 10, 10 additional shares of stock. So when you open up your account the next day, you'll see 110 shares of stock, but it's not going to be at the closing price of 100 anymore. It's going to be something less to make the total the same. So if you had you know, 100 shares of stock at, ten, you know, uh, $10 a share, that's $1,000 worth of stock. Now you, you open up your account at 100 and you see 110 shares of stock, it's going to be multiplied by the new stock price to equal that same 100. So that has to be something less than 10, 9 and change. Uh, to get back, because you so you don't really get any additional. It's like a stock split. If it was a two for one stock split, then you'd have 200 shares times five for that same $1,000. So it's like a mini stock split. It's like a 10% stock split. So you're not getting any cash. You're not even getting any additional value. It's like the stock split. You're just getting some additional shares. This is not as common but they could declare a dividend where they just give you more shares of stock, but they're going to lower, the stock price is going to be lower to, re to make sure that the actual value of your account is the same, just like a stock split. Right. Dividend reinvestment plans. These are one of the ways, the only way that you can buy stock without a broker, a stock broker, or an exchange. This basically, the company sells you the stock directly. And most common for employees who uh, are going to buy stock for the company they work with. They call them um, DRIPS because they're, they were a dividend reinvestment plan. So basically, you buy stock at the company. Any dividends the company pays, they give you more stock for those dividends. They actually take the cash and buy a fraction of a share for your account. And since the company owns the stock, they can break the stock up into fractions. So it's a way of... Uh, building some company loyalty. So, have another slide? No. so the company loyalty would be that, you know, I have Exxon drip account and every month I invest a thousand dollars into my Exxon uh, dividend reinvestment account and whatever dividends Exxon pays, I get that goes into the account and I buy more shares. Uh, the, the thing that's a pain about this is if you had tried to build a diverse portfolio and you had 16 or 20 companies like this, now you're getting 20 different statements, 20 different tax forms. It makes it really difficult organizationally um, at the year end tax wise to organize and pay for um, and record all this activity. The companies 
generally like the dividend reinvestment plans for two reasons. One, as sort of like an additional benefit to employees. And if you're not an employee, they like it as a marketing tool because they can advertise to you and say, why would you get gas anywhere else if you have a dividend reinvestment plan with Exxon? Always buy your gas with us because whatever profits we make, we give back to you. So they can build certain brand loyalty. And they found that you're 90 times more likely to open up a financial statement on your stock account than you are in advertising something that's advertised and sent to you in the mailer as an advertisement. So if you see something as an advertisement, you more likely will throw it out. But if you see a financial statement with your money in it, you're going to open it up. And guess what's in there? A coupon or advertising a new product or even a product sample maybe. Some of these dividend reinvestment plans actually give out Christmas presents. Uh, like um, Wrigley's gum gave out gum one, you know, it would just mail uh, a coupon for a free pack of gum or, you know. So they try to build some little marketing through these programs as well. The great thing is that you're not really paying any fees or any brokerages or any, the costs are very low to do this. That's the only real benefit. The costs are super low. And it's easier to do the dollar cost averaging because when you sign up for these, they ask for sort of like a repetitive uh, investment not just a one-time purchase. And it's easy to do repetitive investing weekly or monthly because there are no transaction fees. So that's why some investors prefer these dividend reinvestment plans because you can keep buying the stock and building the account without having to pay any fees. Okay, let's talk about uh, blue chip stocks. These are, I guess it's derived from, you know, at, at one point blue chips were the most valuable uh, gambling chip in a gambling casino, but today the gambling chips are, are to be counterfeit proof, so there are all sorts of weird uh, colors and patterns on them, so you can't really easily counterfeit them. But blue chips, if you get like an old poker set at home and you have white, red, and blue chips, blue chips are supposed to be the most valuable. And that's why they, they have nicknamed the best stocks. Generally, the S&P 500 Dow 30 stocks are considered blue chips. Big developed companies that have a long track record, track record of being stable and earnings and, and revenues and dividends. And, you know, AT&T, well, AT&T has had gone through so many changes, but still, I guess, kind of considered a blue chip now. It's still a pretty big company. Oil companies established, you know, big companies like McDonald's, GM, um, are blue chips. Uh, P&G is a big consumer staples company. Uh, income stocks are stocks that are the, their biggest, they may not be big growth oriented stocks, but they are tr traditional high dividend payers, which is what we consider uh, income stocks. So stocks that pay uh, above average dividends. And growth stocks are the stocks that have, have had and continue to have a large growth trajectory. They're opening more stores. They're expanding their business. More more people are discovering them and buying them. Um, you could look at, you know, the coffee area has been a growth area for this country for a while. And if you look at Dunkin' Donuts or Starbucks, there's still a lot of locations left they can open up worldwide. And if it's in the case of Dunkin' Donuts, there's a lot of locations inside the country that they can open up because they're pretty much crammed all on the northeast, and they have the whole west and 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 south that they can move into pretty aggressively. And that's, that's growth. You know, Apple, maybe the growth of Apple is sort of sorting to slow because as I can see, no one wants the Apple watch. We all have our Apple phones and iPads and now we're just replacing them. So unless they think of a new, a new um, device everybody needs to have, they're probably not gonna be as big of a growth company. Uh, but maybe they will be if everybody continues what the college students here have continued is switching over all their laptops to Apple from PCs. And if I see here, 80% of the students here have Apple laptops. And five years ago, it was the opposite. 80% was IBM. Generally, college students are the first to adapt to that. If the, uh, your parents and everybody else move towards it as well, that could be a big growth area for Apple. So it really depends on what you feel. But typically, I think any stock that grows more than 20% in revenues and earnings is a growth stock. Those stocks, share prices go up the fastest. Then, of course, we have our tech stocks. Some stocks can be growth and tech. But tech stocks are basically just represent technology as a market. And technology stocks generally are more volatile than the average stock, especially a technology stock that you get that becomes very popular, like the Yelp app. Is, would be considered a technology stock because it's internet-based. Uh, so it's not hard technology, but it's still considered technology. And 
All right. Speculative stocks are what I've seen a lot of people trading in the virtual stock exchange. And speculative stocks are um, companies that have some great potential, but a lot of risk. Uh, maybe we could think of uh, this semester Alibaba as a company that has had a lot of risk, but a lot of growth potential. Under Armour, Under Armour is moving out of speculative into growth, definitely. But there are some companies. Uh, GoPro, which I mentioned earlier, is a very speculative stock, and the, it, the stock price is far stripped to any rational valuation for the company. But just people are excited about this company it has a buzz about it right now. Um, let's see if they're up today. Up, they're down. They're down four percent. Very volatile stock. Um, the market overall today is, we'll say, uh, flat to up. Okay. Cyclical stocks are stocks that change with the economy. They go up when the economy goes up, and they go down when the economy goes down. So things that um, that could be closely tied to the economy, things that use for construction or, or uh, housing generally is closely tied to the economy, even retail. So things that are you know will grow logically as the economy grows will be called cyclical stocks, and they'll go down as the economy goes down. Defensive stocks are stocks that don't react as much or to the economy or very little to the economy. So stocks like cigarette and beer companies, um, low-end food companies, fast food restaurants, um, dollar stores, these things actually improve with economic contractions rather than go down. So if there's an economic contraction, people say, well, I'm not going to smoke less. I'm not going to stop taking my prescription drugs. I'm not going to drink less. I'll probably drink more. I'm not going to go to fancy restaurants, but maybe I'll go more to fast food restaurants or fast casual restaurants. Or I'm not going to shop at Target. Maybe I'll go to the dollar store instead. So these are defensive stocks that you can move your money into when the economy is contracting because they're going to do better or not worse when the economy goes down. So market capitalization we talked about earlier, and we could break stocks up into small, mid, and large cap stocks based on their capitalization. So large cap stocks generally capitalizations over 10 billion. These are the biggest companies, blue chip companies, uh, SP 500, Dow types of companies. Big sales, big revenues, big brand recognition. You all, you should know most of the large cap companies. The mid caps are those two to 10 billion dollar companies. A lot of companies on Long Island are mid caps, um, and these are just the. Uh, Everyday companies are not super huge, but they're still well known. They still generate a large amount of sales and have are significantly large, but they're just not ginormous, you know. And that's where a lot of stocks fit in this middle category. The most uh, number-wise, most stocks are small caps. There's a lot more small caps than mid or large caps, and they're generally a market capitalization of two billion or less. And that, you know, a two billion dollar company is still a pretty big company. So even though it says a small cap. You know, a, a 1.5, $2 billion company is still a pretty big company as far as capitalization. Uh, however, this can go down to, you know, much smaller, $500 million company in capitalization, $200 million. So you can have some what I would call small to micro caps. And it's just a way of slicing and dicing the stocks up. Of course, you have your globalization of the world and financial markets. And then we, of course, have... Um, Global stocks to choose from as, as a pool of stocks. Um, U.S. market is the largest of all the stock markets, but the global market, right now the U.S. equities only represent 35% of the total world's equity. That's down from 50% 10 years ago. Uh, but it's still the country with the largest single percentage of world equity. So there's there's a 65% of the stocks exist outside of the U.S. Um, companies. So going global, we talked about, especially with Alibaba, you can buy Chinese stocks, Japanese stocks, stocks, any big companies in any market can become um, a good investment idea for you for diversification and just, you know, getting into access to uh, 
good ideas outside of the country. Uh, buying internet, uh, international mutual funds is an easy way to diversify into international stocks if they're brands or companies you may not be as familiar with because they don't do as much business inside the U.S. Um, I mean, it could be, it definitely has more risk and it's trickier. It's complex to buy stocks outside of the U.S. stock markets or companies that are foreign based, but often the returns are much higher in this area. Now, with international stocks, the returns on international stocks are going to be mixed in with currency. So, whatever incomes you get, dividends and capital gains, you have to also look at exchange rates between if you're moving if you're buying the company in foreign exchange dollars and translating it back to US dollars that's going to have an effect as well that's why people like to buy it through New York Stock Exchange like Baba so you don't have to actually get Chinese currency to buy it on Chinese market yeah so in different investment strategies that you can have is buying value companies companies that you feel are valuable and underpriced uh, and that could be mixed with an accumulation, capital accumulation, trying to buy stocks where the goal is the stock for the stock prices to go up, which is in a, the opposite of that would be buying stocks for the goal for to generate income or the dividends are increasing. So it just depends on your different angle. You can have a mixed strategy of common combination of these, or you could just really go for stocks that have momentum and the stock prices continuing to move up to capital appreciation, stocks that have a better income stream, or stocks that just seem to have more value, could be a little undervalued that you think will, will uh, be appreciated later on. And definitely the best uh, investment strategy is what we call the buy and hold strategy. Don't worry, I'm keeping track of the time we have, one minute and, 60 th and 53 seconds. Uh, buy and hold strategy is one where you buy the stocks that you feel are great and have good potential, and you hold on to them for a long term. Because that's really where you don't, short term f would be a waste of money for many stocks that over 10, 20 year period has returned a terrific, a terrific amount of returns to investors. And if you get a stock, but just remember, just imagine Lowe's or Home Depot or Microsoft or Cisco or IBM when they were small and growing and you held on to them for 20 years. This is how people, these secretaries at companies who have stock options become millionaires because the stock grows so much faster than their income as, a, as an employee because they have, they have no choice but to hold it. Uh, another strategy we talked about before is current income, just buying investments to generate dividends and income that you may want to live off. Generally, when you're closer to retirement or retired, you would do that. Uh, quality long-term growth is just another synonymous, uh, synonymous with buy and hold strategy, buying good companies that are going to have a long-term, uh, uh, be a long-term staple in the economy and, and, and just going to be around for a long time and going to appreciate just, you know, sort of like a McDonald's is not going anywhere. Starbucks is not going anywhere. These are companies or Dunkin' Donuts. They'd be a long-term strategy. I'm just going to buy them because I know that they're going to be good for long-term. Uh, aggressive stock management is more of what you do in your, in your market watch accounts. Just buying whatever, trading quickly, aggressively to, to make money. And people in this class, a number of people in this class have made over $100,000 million, $100, doing this. But it's risky, and I think that is what the, the corner point here. And some people are even riskier where they're specu blindly speculating or short-term uh, trading intraday, uh, sort of like um, really extreme amounts of shares and quantities to try to get uh, profits. All right. That's the all, all the time we have today. We went over about a minute. Thank you for hanging in. I will see you on Monday. Have a great week. And...